Welcome to the Fabrication Laboratory. This sign was made with the equipment in the laboratory. Well, the day is finally come. I can't think about you. How about that? Yeah, how about this? Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, I remember. I remember. I sure do. Thanks for being here. The day is here. How are you feeling? You okay? Well, I'm just absolutely delighted that North Carolina Central University is embarking upon a new frontier um, with the help of our friends and colleagues from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. This historic day-to-day -day allows our students and students in the Durham community to really engage in the maker space uh, right here on our beautiful campus. So I'm absolutely excited. I want to thank uh, Dr. Calhoun for all of her hard work in making this day a, a reality for us all. Get one more. <laughs> the idea behind the music hackathon is to invent uh, new black musical instruments and new black musical idioms and bring these things to the planet, things that have never been seen before, and the most important significance relative to NCCU as it's happening here. And it's, it's, a, it's a world first, so it's a very, very important endeavor. Uh, will occur, you know, due to the Fab Lab, but really due to the spirit of innovation and invention that's being built here in a new and interesting way relative to technology uh, and due to the, the, the new Fab Lab here at NCC. Good Eagle morning. I am uh, Deb Saunders White. I have the pleasure of serving as the 11th Chancellor of North Carolina Central University. I am so delighted to see so many of you out this morning for this very special occasion. And I know that there's somebody else doing introductions, but my boss is here. So if you don't mind if I uh, acknowledge him, uh, Dr. Tendo, uh, member of our board of trustees. You know, this is really a special day for our students, our faculty, and the entire Durham community. I am just ecstatic about this fabrication laboratory. It really marks, I think, a, uh, a, a, a true milestone for our institution. It is an environment that will allow our current students to really thrive in the area of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the STEM space. But we're going to put an A in the middle of that, and we're going to make it STEAM. So I know I have uh, my colleagues from the arts that are here, but we're excited because not only can we start talking about STEAM, but we can start producing. And it is with um, much honor and distinction that I acknowledge two people who really made this truly possible, Dr. and Mrs. Williams. I know we're going to acknowledge you uh, later in the program, but I just, and I see Faye kind of going, she's all script. <laughs> but it's okay, just flow with it, Faye. Um, but let me just sh share this uh, with you. Dr. and Mrs. Williams came to visit me soon after my arrival here on the campus. And we just had a wonderful chat. And from that chat, led to a series of emails. He shared with me that he had done 40 years at MIT. And that he was able to do that because of the foundation that North Carolina Central University had provided him. And so we started talking about how we could have a, a partnership with MIT. And one thing grew from another, and he gave me the name of Topper Carew. I had no idea who, that, who owned that name, 
but it's a powerful force behind that name. And so Topper, you and I met and uh, just kind of hit it off and we started talking about how we could bring the wonders of MIT closer to, uh, to our institution. And so I want to thank him for all of your um, hard work. So these are the folks that made it indeed possible. And we know that this day where we are cutting a ribbon to really acknowledge the beginning of something. And um, I really want us to focus on the beginning because this really, I think, is what the Academy is all about. It really is about institutions working together to ensure that America's brightest minds are a part of the fabric of our economy. And so I can't think of a better match than North Carolina Central University and MIT. We bring them up a little bit, don't we? <laughs> I just had to say that. Um, so this, this laboratory couldn't have happened without a lot of dedicated folks. And I'm gonna let them be introduced. Um, but I'm, I must tell you that this was just a twinkle in our eye. And for us today to have the type of equipment that I think will be impressive to you, uh, that you will see. But more importantly, we have students who will show you how to get it done. And so when I think about where we can go in this frontier called STEAM. I am extraordinarily excited and really welcome the opportunity to be a part of this team called North Carolina Central University. So welcome. The Makers Movement officially starts here today on our campus and I'd like to share with you, to my knowledge, this is the first one in North Carolina. Am I right, Dave? Possibly. Um, but let me just share, there are only 88 of these in the nation. And so we join a very distinguished community. So uh, thank you for coming to be a part of this. Thank you for sharing in our new frontier. And to the students over here to my right, we aren't done yet, man. This ride's going to be fabulous, and we are so excited to have you help steer this ship. Thank you. I uh, wanted to just briefly talk just a little bit about um, what uh, North Carolina Central has been to me and my wife, but also make a connection between this institution and uh, my having a chance to meet someone at MIT over my 40 years there uh, that have made some connections that says to us that we really must uh, um, not forget where we came from. Um, I um, um, had a chance to uh, uh, learn a very valuable lesson from one of my professors here, Dr. Helen G. Edwards. Uh, she was my mentor. And one of the things she used to tell our class when she would come back from flying to Washington, D.C., uh, she was very political. Uh, and she was probably the first black woman to be a part of the Republican Party. She actually would come back to our institution here and tell us stories. And there were two things that she told me that I never forgot. One was that um, she made lemons, took lemons and made lemonade out of them. When she would get on the airplane, nobody would sit with her. And she said that was fine because it would just give her more room for her to take the job and do her work. Uh, so she never let that get her down. The second thing she told me, and I never forgot, was that uh, you 
you need to document your history. And she said that if you don't document it, somebody else would document it and it won't be like what you thought it should be. So hence, I have always done that and I've always emphasized in my 40 years at MIT and before is to work with our folks and try to see how I could be of help as she was to me. And so I actually had an opportunity to, um, um, to go over the country and interview over 200 black students uh, and administrators who had come to MIT and had gotten their degree. And I always wanted to do that because I wanted to find out how they got there, who helped them to get there, and how can we continue to increase that number. And so one of the persons who I interviewed, who was very, very interesting, was a young man who I had heard about <coughs> since I had been at MIT for 1972, I was a, a young man who uh, decided after coming out of Boston, black community to develop some a TV show called Say Brothers. And he was known throughout Boston, particularly in the black community. And so I wanted to find out more about him. So I flew out to California to interview him and his wife. Uh, and there are a couple of things that I want to share with you about him because it is a very excellent message for all of us. First of all, this young man tested to go into one of the best high schools in Boston. Um, he got a little cocky high. And being there, he actually didn't really study as well as he should have but his test scores were off the charts. And so he actually, when he was 16 years old, he actually got a job at Harvard University at a fraternity house. And he saw how good and how happy these young men were doing in their school. And so when he came back to his high school, he said that he was going to go to Harvard. So he asked two counselors, one was black, was white. And the first person he went to, the counselor, he said that he wanted, um, well, the counselor asked him, what do you want to do? He said, well, uh, I want to go to college. And so he said, where, where would you like to go? He said, I want to go to Harvard. And so, so the counselor looked at his school was and all that. He hadn't worked that well, so he hadn't done that well. And so the counselor told him that he should get a job in a, a metal worker of some kind of uh, Navy job. Yes. So he then had a chance to talk to the black counselor. And the black counselor had been very nice all during his, his years there, speaking to all of the black students. So he told the black counselor, after he asked, the counselor asked him, so what do you want to do? He said, well, I want to go to Harvard. So he said, well, this is your junior year, so work very hard, and maybe you'll be able to get there. And so he worked hard, and so the counselor called him back when it was time for him to decide as to which school he was going to go to. And so the counselor, this black counselor, who became a tremendous leader in Boston, said to him, well, you... I, I can get you into a school that has an H, but I can't get you into Harvard, but I can get you into Howard University. Okay? And so he went to Howard University and made such a major impression that they sent him to Yale to give a presentation on his innovation. And so Yale University saw him and said, we might to let him go back to Nova. How about we want to keep him here? That's how he got 
both of his degrees from Howard, uh, from uh, Yale University. My point is this, that after that time, when you follow his career, he has made excellent and major contributions to his community that helped him to get out of Roxbury. Because if that black counselor had told him the same thing that that white counselor had told him, he would not even go to Howard University. And so he has never forgotten that. And if you go back and look at his trail, he has consistently been on the top level. His filmmaking are some of the top movies dealing with our life. If you go back and look at uh, his programs there, and if you look at what he has done now, he is off the charts in terms of what is being done at MIT at our media lab. I have watched many of us come through that institution for 40 years, and not one has made the impact that he has made. So we are just thankful that he has been able to come to our school and pass it on. And I can relate to it because I have never forgotten where I came from. So my wife and I just love being at, at NCCU. Thank you so much. is a Durham native and graduate of Charles E. Jordan High School, received his bachelor's and master's degree and PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Nuclear Engineering. He has worked in the industry, in government, in labor, laboratories, and higher education institutions, and was one of the founding members of the National Society of Black Engineers at MIT. Both my parents worked here, and uh, like Clarence said, uh, having good mentors uh, can send you very far. I remember Dr. Edmonds, uh, Dr. Howell Fitz, uh, the, the faculty here uh, supported not only the, the students here, but the whole community. Before we moved out into the county and I uh, went to Gibbons and then Jordan, uh, I lived right around the corner on Plum Street right next to McDougal Terrace. And this was home, our academic oasis. And Clarence is a product of this institution. And when I got to MIT, it was fortunate to have a mentor there that is as encouraging and as 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 he is. So there are Others that have benefited from Clarence's tutelage. Uh, and the list is long. The, the uh, book, Technology in the Dream, uh, I think has about 200 uh, interviews. Uh, but his impact has been much broader than that, <coughs> much deeper than that. And uh, I, I'm recalling the time when he got a call from one of his students. I I guess I consider myself one of his students who never took a class with him. The most important learning happens outside of the class anyway. One of his students called him to uh, invite him down to Florida. Uh, He was going into space and Ron McNair invited him down for his first successful Space voyage. So there are any number of, of uh, times where you can look back on the encouragement and, and motivation that you get from your community. And we have a rich community here. Uh, MIT's connection to North Carolina uh, began with its first black graduate. Some of you may have have recalled earlier this year that um, Robert Taylor received a postage stamp uh, in honor of his accomplishments. But he was MIT's first black graduate, and he's a North Carolinian. And after Robert Taylor left MIT, 
School of Architecture. In fact, the first architecture program in the country was at MIT. Robert Taylor joined this upstart who went down to uh, uh, Tennessee, Booker T. Washington, and he designed most of the buildings in the 30 years that he was there. And you may also know that Robert Taylor's granddaughter, Valerie Jarrett, is President Obama's senior advisor. So there is a lot to be gained from having strong mentorship relationships, strong opportunities for faculty and students to work together. And the Fab Lab is an excellent opportunity for that to occur. Students get excited about learning when they see things in action, when they get to see the not only the why and why fours that you get from lecture, you get from your textbooks, you get from uh, in-depth intellectual discussions with your colleagues, but you see it happen in front of you in a laboratory space. So the Fab Lab will have this incredible uh, impact on student learning, on student excitement, and the ability to bring the community into uh, this interaction. So I congratulate the university on its insight and uh, uh, forward thinking and grabbing hold of this opportunity. I look forward to the students gaining so much from this, as well as the broader Durham community. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jerry Willisby, the freshman physics class manager here at NCC. Uh, I'm caught here to introduce Dr. Colin Topper Kuru. Topper Kuru is the director of the Innovation and Inclusion Initiative uh, at the Media Lab at MIT. He, his work involves designing, assessing, implementing of innovation centers at selectively HBCUs, which in, yesterday he talked about it as uh, cultural audacity. Career ho uh, Kuru holds a BS in architecture at MS in environmental design from Yale University. He has been at the MIT fellow and a broadcasting fellow with the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. His independent production company, Rainbow Television Workshops, produces content for the cable and the network program. He's also created uh, one of the most famous series for uh, black, oh, talking about black, black, uh, Martin, where we're now, uh, most people have seen it still on TV today. Dr. Thank you, and Clarence, thank you. Kind of remarks. Last time I was in Raleigh Dorm was a couple of years ago for the uh, the 50th reunion of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and for the Raleigh Cities. So I am a former uh, SNCC field secretary. Uh, most of my time was spent in Cambridge, Maryland, and in the Delta of uh, Mississippi, a place called Tallahatchie County. College roommate and I were there. 19, Roxbury changed my life forever. I probably would not have done that had I not gone to Howard. Uh, John Lewis was our chairman. Anybody still be done? We changed the face of Mississippi, changed the face of the Democratic Party. And when you experience that, changes your life forever. So if you were to look at the thread of all of my work, it's about uh, ascendancy, it's about uh, love of our, of our culture, our experience, love of our brothers and sisters, and uh, bringing out all the different ways that we can make a difference. Um, I've had a very rich uh, career, and uh, the laboratory that I'm in MIT is called the Lifelong Kindergarten. So I'm back in kindergarten again. And, uh, on 
this particular tour at MIT, which is due to my two great mentors in life, who are both emeritus and due to my friendship with Clarence, uh, and due to the fact that I felt that I was falling behind in the technology space, due to my children, uh, I decided that I would try to launch a career for myself uh, in technology. I have, and I feel very good about it. The call came from Clarence when initiative which I have self-funded and unfortunately not to be able to do that. Clarence called and said, well, as you think about these innovation centers, and what are they? They're basically uh, replicas of the MIT Media Lab. Uh, and they are recognizing that the importance of putting tools and the access uh, to production uh, in the reach and hands of our young people can be very important and very powerful as we think about invention and innovation, but more significantly as we think about the significance and the importance of creating young black inventors and young black innovators and young black computer scientists. Okay, I'm personally convinced, by the way, uh, due to how history and how change, uh, you know, change is in our DNA, it's in our cultural DNA. You know, I have, I have this 30-second uh, uh, history of, of, of black America that I invented for my, my own self. It's cultural audacity. You know we have cultural audacity. You know what that means? Well, it well, puts on a hat. We a hat on. <laughs> we have creative audacity because we have historically challenged uh, the Eurocentric boundaries that have been put upon us. You would not have a civil rights movement uh, if it weren't for our creative audacity. We have human capacity. When you think about the kind of weight that we've had to carry uh, throughout our time, this particular continent. It's extraordinary. But we keep springing back. All right? So we have political tenacity. Uh, Baltimore, Ferguson, just see how these young people, as they begin to speak to the issue of Black Lives Matter, have created a new methodology, a whole new uh, approach and response to what's going on with our black and Latino men, the issues of poverty. So, you know, we're in We have spiritual veracity. Now, going back to this Clarence story, things like this make you believe in God. See, now, I went to a, a test high school with 10 black students. All boys can wear neckties, all that kind of thing. And they tolerated me because I ran track. And the first guidance counselor I went to was John O'Brien, a white man. When I told him I wanted to go to Harvard, he told me, I think you'd be better off going to work in the Navy. Now, here's how God and spiritual veracity was. Three weeks later, they hired the first black guidance counselor in high school. He calls me, John O'Brien. He says, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to college. He said, where do you want to go? I want to go to Harvard. He said, well, you puzzled me. He told me about my test scores. He told me about my grades. And I told him I just didn't like school. I had a grandfather who homeschooled me. You know, I never bought a toy. Every toy I had, we made. You know, I never was given a Every dollar and dime I had was because I used to mop the hallways in my apartment business. You know, and when I was in the fourth grade, I had to remember, I had to memorize the poem If. And that was the way I got my dinner. So when this guidance counselor told me you should go in the Navy yard, I just remembered that line in the poem If. But all men doubt you. So, that's why I believe in God and spiritual veracity. So when I got to the media lab, for me, it's not just about, you know, there was a whole discussion going on about how can we get another student here? Let's get one more student here. Let's get two students here. 
I've always believed in scale ever since I was a kid. I don't like to do small things. I like to do big things. I don't like to do something that everybody else is doing. You know, I want to be outside the box. So, uh, the idea of, you know, sharing the knowledge, the deep knowledge, the profound knowledge that, and research that is generated at the MIT Media Lab said to me that why don't we select a few of the historically black colleges and universities and create a collaboration with those, in, those institutions and build something new and special that will change the conversation in a new and interesting way at the HBCUs and recognize that when we begin to plant the seeds and we begin to make the means of production available to young people Something's going to happen. Just the very notion of history itself recognizes that when you have intellectual capital, when you have the means of production, when you have this triangle in which this school exists, something's going to happen. And when we look back five, six, seven, eight years from now, we will see a black Bill Gates, we will see a black Mark Zuckerberg, we will see a black Steve Jobs. And some of those will be women. And just like people thought that there would never be a black president, I think the real issue now is when are we going to have a second black president and will that be a woman? It's inevitable. It's historically inevitable. Because if you look at the continuum of time, you look at the DNA, our DNA change, and our cultural audaciousness, our creative tenacity, our capacity, our veracity, it's inevitable. So that's going to happen. Now, one very interesting model for me is music. When the affordable means of production became available due to the miniaturization of equipment to urban youth, they created rap. Hip-hop was created. Now, it's not the first time in history that we've done that. But if you look at the economic bottom by the totality of the dollars and the influence that those inventions and innovations have created in the world, it is zillions and zillions and zillions of dollars. And if you look at another measure that Dr. Dre just sold a company to Apple for $3 billion due to his cultural audacity and creative audacity, and by the way, they just didn't want the earphones. But I will tell you, I was in a very Euro five-star kind of hotel in New York. And right there on the side table was a card saying that the sound system has been brought, brought to you by Beats and Dr. Dre. Now, whoever thought that a young man who had come out of the group NWA <laughs> would have a blackboard in a five-star hotel and Apple is after him three billion dollars, they did not want the headphones. They want his thoughts. They want his curation. The thing they were after was his music subscription service. The very thought that history tells us that there will be greatness evolving from NCCU is important to know and to recognize. It's going to happen. It's, there's no question about it. It is historically inevitable. All right, so that brings us to the next project. We got from lab. I mean, I came down. I was blown away. Absolutely. So we're thinking now about music hackathon, and the the framing of this is very, 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 very okay. And this is how I tell the story when I move around. I say that at NCCU. They're about to have a music hackathon. And they say, well, what is that? I say, they are going to invent and innovate and create, due to fabrication and hacking, new black musical instruments that have never been seen on the planet before. That's innovation. And it's possible. We've been describing a process by which that can occur. And then they're going to create music that pushes the idioms of jazz and of hip-hop and of classical music and electronic instrument, I mean electronic music. And that's possible because now there are 
tools. And Sally, you look very helpful. <laughs> there are tools, all right? But there is genius, all right? And it's a genius that has been bottled up. And I know that when it gets its hands on the tools, it begins to make and do, and that's the whole pedagogy at MIT. When that occurs, we are going to see things that we've never seen in the universe before. Right? And they're going to come from here. And that's a beautiful and powerful thing. So it's, so it's, it's, like, it's like the hat store. Okay? No, let me give you another one. Stravinsky uses 12 notes, right? He goes out one door. He creates beautiful music. But Stevie Wonder uses the same 12 notes, and he goes out the other door. And he makes beautiful songs, and more people listen to his songs than they listen to Stravinsky. See, that's our thing. There's something that's very special. And as long as we let the culture lead, we'll always make a difference. We'll always innovate. And I think you just need to buckle up and pay yourself Greatness flow from this place. So that's the music. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Natalie Bravo Batista. I am a sophomore pharmaceutical science student here at North Carolina Central University. Dr. Faye Calhoun is the interim director of the Fab Lab and serves as the director of the North Carolina Glaxos Midline Foundation supported STEM scholars program. Prior to that, she was the interim director of the Biomedical Biotechnology Research Institute. Dr. Calhoun came to NCCU in 2009 after retiring from the National Institutes of Health. Beginning last July, she worked with administrators, faculty, and students to establish the Fab Lab as it is today. Dr. Calhoun. As one of the students that have benefited from your leadership and service in this project, I am grateful for your dedication to the goal of having a place for fabrication, creativity, and innovation become a reality here at NCCU. It is an honor for me to present um, Dr. Pico. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being with us today. And this is mainly for the students, this part right here. When you get an assignment, it's all about the what, where, how, and the why. What, where, how, and why a family at NCCU. Right now, today, these questions have been answered. And there's nothing better than the thrill of victory and the thrill that should be felt by any number of people in this room. Together we made it happen. We shared the thrill, we shared the victory. And as you have heard, and it all started with the Chancellor and the Provost, returning from a visit to MIT lit up like Christmas trees. You should have said, oh my God. They called me to the office and they were still lit. It was a week later after they got there. I mean, they, had, they were lit. <laughs> they had seen it. They had the vision. And the chancellor said, I want it here and now. <laughs> That's how it sounded to me. <laughs> I was clear on the why. The why was because the chancellor said she wanted it here and now. Okay, so that's the why. So now we have where, how, and what. Right? Okay. The provost said, we can do this. And I will identify the where. Okay. I was stuck on the what. <laughs> what the heck is a fab lab? <laughs> Four of us went up to MIT, and we saw the mighty MIT and the mighty MIT fab labs. labs. And we came, came back and we said, how? How? How do we make that happen here? 
and a team began to form around the where question. And we were grateful for Dr. Takuda, who said, here, room 3221, a room he used for a computer instruction. And let me tell you, it did not look a thing like it looks today. Dr. Takuda, we want to thank you. Where are you? Stand up. So we had the where. And the small initial team, four, that went up to the MIT group, into the renovation and fab lab establishment team with the architect, first of all. He had to turn that space into something that it is today, and that's Tim McMullen. Stand, please. Thank you. Project management, uh, he's not here. He hides a lot of time. Mike Logan, uh, Phil Powell's facility management group. They had a lot of cleaning to do. Purchasing, Herbie Graham, are you here? Purchasing uh, faculty from several departments. Will that uh, development team please stand? Everybody that served with me through all of this, please stand up. Thank you so much. And a renovated space emerged. And Dr. Carew provided a list of required equipment. And over time, it was ordered, delivered, and installed. And the ordering and delivery, where is Ashley Grace? Ashley, the administrative assistant for the whole She did it. And the highlight of this whole thing happened when we were recognized, accepted, and registered with the International Fab Foundation at MIT. And we're listed on their website. We're listed right below Fab Lab Moscow. Fab Lab Finland, Fab Lab Athens, we're right up there. They say they have two to 300, is it 300 Fab Labs across the world? And right on there is Fab Lab NCCU, right there. <laughs> and we are the first HBCU to have that distinction. Along the way, the how question continued. And we are lucky enough to find people to help us. And I was screaming, help, 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 help. I wanted people to orient us, to encourage us. And they were members of the large international network of persons experienced in creating, making, innovating, and doing. And we are grateful to you, Jeff Cruz. Jeff Cruz is in the house. Where are you, baby? Space. It's not a fab, I don't think it's a fab lab, but they sell memberships and it's down, downtown and everything. It's really something. He knows what he's doing. And Dr. Haley, is he, is he making it? Maybe not. Uh, they came in with the advice and some of the training. And then Sally Corp. <laughs> Sally Corp. Her background is the shop box, which you will see. It's a fantastic instrument, but a piece of equipment, and she's hanging in there and plans to hang with us. Okay. <laughs> okay, these people were what we call, you know, rock stars in this particular kind of advice. You know, you can have your track stars and your athletes and all like that, but the fabrication rock stars uh, have helped us a lot. And this Fab Lab is going to stimulate a culture of creativity and innovation on this campus, and I know it. Without, the key is without the reliance on formal coursework. You don't have to move, you don't have to take advanced physics and, and, and programming and all those kinds of things. Our ancestors didn't do that. They created a whole bunch of stuff without all of that coursework. Now, this is without coursework. You've got to have some training. Most of what we own are products that were created, patented, and sold to us. We just want to do a little bit of that here. 
So we're going to foster interdisciplinary collaborations, projects between different departments. We've got Dr. Barrett, Dr. Hume here from the music department. Wave your hand in the air. Thank you. They're with us. we got Dr. Arlene Everhart and Wadia Bea here from Human Sciences. Hands in the air. Thank you. We're going to get the theater department in the house and the art department. And we are going to have, we're going to prove there's no room for silos in the fabrication business. It's just us. We're going to come together and make it happen. We're going to foster innovation in this community. We're going to introduce middle school kids to the concepts. Get them here. Start, begin where they are now. And move them a couple of steps forward in the fabrication world. And most of all, we're going to interact and share with the international Fab Lab community. I'm getting emails. People say, uh, you know, we are putting together a team and we would like to come to the United States. And when can you tell us that we can visit your laboratory? I say, not now, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but soon, very soon and very soon, you all come. And uh, so that should be interesting. So you're going to go and see the lab. And when you see the lab, you're going to see all different sizes and shapes of equipment. It's going to look complex, but it's not really complex. Because when you're working on fabrication, the first thing, there's only four steps to the whole thing. The first thing you have to do is go somewhere quiet, research, plan, and design what you're going to do. Just can't jump on the equipment. you got to spend some time your computer in the library. And you got to figure out or get somebody to figure out how to establish the settings for that piece of equipment. Then you want to simulate that project. And finally, you want to produce the project. So those four, those are the four steps. That's all. And so I'm excited about all the possibilities to make a better, new, innovative, make better new and innovative ways of doing Thank you for being a part of this day. I want to call on the, the programs. Thank you so much, Dr. Calhoun. And um, yeah, she was actually correct because when the Chancellor and I came back from MIT, we were literally lit up. Ah. So she was correct. Um, but what she left out in the what, where, and why was the who. Because on the way back, the Chancellor and I had a conversation after we visited with uh, Dr. Karu, had a conversation about who should we give this assignment to. And we knew a couple of things had happened. One, we really didn't really know how to capture the imagination of what we saw there, because it was so powerful. And we were thinking, well, in order for us to bring this to the campus, we need to find somebody who is going to subscribe to it, who will believe in it, who will take it to the next level and transform what we're thinking. It was really a tough challenge for us because we went through a whole lot of names. Of course, we have so many very talented faculty here. It's no question about it. And so, finally, we settled on Dr. Kahu. And I'm not even sure how we came to that, but we did settle on Dr. Kahu, and uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and we said, she is the right person. And so we called her in and gave her the challenge. And I could see the look in her eyes. Uh, and then she asked me, well, how am I going to do it? Well, that's why I have you. <laughs> you know, why don't you think about it? <laughs> and of course, um, as you heard her mention, she pulled the team together and they made it happen. Uh, and, uh, for me personally, I have to acknowledge my chancellor because in leadership, you have to have vision. And oftentimes, the leader sees something that nobody sees. Nobody can even imagine that. And the leader sees that. That's what we call vision. And then, of course, she tries to sell that to people. And she asked me to come along to MIT. I'd never been into media, media lab before. 
But once I got there, we developed Scratch and all of that, and uh, I got very excited. In fact, I beat the Chancellor in, in this Scratch game, you know. Uh, but the idea here is that if you can imagine it, you can make it happen. If you can dream it, you can make it happen. On our campus here, you've heard so many things said about innovation, creation, and the culture of you know transforming and making. Our goal is not only to impact our students here on this campus. It is our goal to impact the community, to transform the neighborhood surrounds us, to transform the city that we are in. And I think we are now on our way to that. So I want to, once again, just ask Dr. Carmen to stand up. Would you please give her a hand? And uh, she's already mentioned all of the names. I'm not going to go through all of the names, but I do have a few um, other guests that I want to acknowledge. Who are here with us today, and I see uh, Dr. Michael uh, Page, the chair of the County Commissioner, is here. Would you give him a hand, please? <laughs> and to all of our guests, you know, um, you've, the name has been mentioned. They all played a major role in making this happen. We thank you uh, for what you've done. Give him a hand. <laughs> we also have here uh, our deans. Of course, we couldn't do this without them as well, because uh, without even asking for permission. And Dr. Tukuta said, well, we can use his lab up there. I don't remember calling the dean, asking him if we used them. I just got excited. I said, well, let's do it. And of course, <laughs> finally I called him, and, uh, and I asked him if we could use the, the, the facility. And of course, he says, yes, we could. So I have, with, with our deans, Dr. Wilson, Dean Craig Taylor, Dr. Juanetta Lee, do I see other deans here? Would you please, Dr. Jackson, give him a hand, please. I actually want to acknowledge uh, our faculty and uh, our staff members who are here to support us in so many ways. And uh, the faculty and staff, please raise your hand and please be acknowledged. And then finally, our students, because you've had, you've heard the chance to mention. It is all about our students. Everything that we do here, our motivation, it's about the students. If we don't have the students here, we have no business here. And so everything that you're going to see in the lab from here on will be given by the students. And we do hope that the next project that Dr. Carew is already talking about uh, is also going to take us to uh, a new level a new discovery, and I think years from now, we will be celebrating uh, the new <coughs> creation, the new inventions that are coming out of students or those who have been associated with the NCCU 5 Lab. So we want to thank all of you. If I haven't mentioned your name, and if you're here as a guest, please let me see your hand. Any other guests that uh, may be here? All right, give them a hand, please. So the next uh, step is the most important uh, aspect of our event this morning, and that's the ribbon cut. And uh, I wanted to show you what we're going to use to do that. <laughs> it has NCCU Fab Lab on it. And so I'm going to, uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to once again Thank all of you, uh, our students who have been um, engaged, and all of our partners uh, who have supported us. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, embracing this vision, uh, and we thank you. And of course, our trustee Tendo, we can acknowledge. We want to make sure that uh, we do that again. So we thank all of you for being a part of this this very historic moment uh, at NCCU. And, Yay. Yes. Oh, come on, we gotta go in now. Come in, come in, come in. You can.
can actually create circuit boards with the machines that we have here. And this was a circuit board that was created that could input into an Arduino as well as a battery supply. And the Arduino is going to send currents through this device. And this device, when the currents go through, will open and close. Um, so I was thinking of it as something like a heart valve that can open and close. Uh, but it can also be something artistic where someone can have a, maybe a butterfly display and have the wings actually fluttering on the butterfly. So that's that one. And now let Sally talk about this. Okay, so this was a sign uh, that it was made with using several different tools that you would find in a fab lab. So the acrylic was machined on the shop bot as were the wood pieces here. Then this is a 3D printed peg that's in the shop bot. But you can teach many things. Notice that there's a strip of LED lights on the bottom of that. And that LED lights affect the optics so that when you put it the acrylic in, you're getting the, the way that the part that is carved lights up. And underneath all of it is a little bit of electronics. And again, the circuit boards were carved with the shop on one of the machines here. But you can actually program this to your telephone so that when someone calls you, it rings and it gives you a different color so you know whether it's your child calling you or a, vet, or a marker and you don't want to answer the phone. Or if you were deaf and you couldn't you, hear the phone, that the, uh, that the lights could actually flash to let you know that somebody was calling you. I'm doing the laser 3D printer right now. And I also have uh, my TASBOT 3 3D printer. This is run off of uh, ATS filament. And this one is run off of resin, clear resin. And here are some products. Well, this 3D printer in particular needs to be at 230 on the filament and an 85 bit head. And 85 bit head is this, so the plastic can't stick to the material, so it won't just run off. What happens is a laser goes and lights on the filament to give it more of a clear still feel to it. This came from this, and that came from this. And I'm actually about to print out one now. Oh, great. Uh, I wanted a guitar, and uh, this one was, has a shape of an eagle, as you can probably see. And um, the main reason why I made this is so I could actually I could actually play guitar on the computer screen just by uh, looking up to our system called Makey Make. And what it does is pretty much it encrypts the codes off the keyboard of um, up, down, right, and left. And it pretty much um, any game that's on the computer, you can play it using anything you want to. I just use a very simple, basic type of design that I just put it together and boom, there you go. I need some type of a conductor of electricity. This is just simple tin foil. And I'm going to use that for the ground. And um, everybody has in their bodies some type of electrical current going on inside your body. So what I'm going to do is connect this to ground. And because my hand is touching this, I can actually hook this up to another part on here where my hand will touch as well and I'm actually going to use some coins which is another conductor and now it's loading right now and like I said before the designs are limitless, you can make anything. Yeah, I mean, he made 
made it off the uh, off the uh, laser cut. I say anybody can make one. It's very simple to um, construct, and I just use something very simple, simplistic ideas, and they have instructions as well. Uh, research that I've been working on since uh, September, August time. And uh, what I'm doing is uh, right now is a simulation of voids, which is a simulation of uh, like robotic birds. And what I'm trying to accomplish is um, what I'm trying to accomplish is a bunch of robots where they can work as security, search and rescue type things. So what I did was I observed in nature how birds actually fly and how they flock together. So three, using three rules, cohesion, separation, and alignment, I, can, I was able to accomplish that, as you can see in my example here. So as you see here, you see a nice flock of nine birds actually flying together. They're actually aligned and actually separated equal distance apart using vectors. And as you see here, this is using 75 birds and they're still in the same uh, they are aligned and they're still separated as such. With different factors and coefficients using different equations to see what, what, uh, what equation is the most effective and what for a specific job. So for example, this example will be mainly used for uh, search and rescue so they flock together, they stay together using a tight, uh, uh, a strong security. Rather, rather as here, it will more be used for like a security type thing as where they can cover such an area, uh, they can cover a, a greater area at one time. So, and uh, recently in February, I won first place at a national conference for my research. So, it's been going very well, and I'm going to take it to 3D soon, and then I'm going to build robots. So, so uh, you have several robots. Those robots can communicate. Uh, how many robots do you need for a given area? And, for instance, if you lose some of them, can you still have you know, a coverage? Coverage for things like surveillance, okay? For search and rescue, for exploration, you name it. So the kind of things where we can get machines, you know, to uh, uh, to help humans, e either helping humans or doing it totally by themselves. So this kind of thing uh, might be what you know would be used for the place like Nepal with the earthquake that just happened. You can have very uh, robots of all kinds of shapes, all kinds, that can help with some of that in the search and rescue type of thing. When it's all said and done, I need to be able to get this in a robot to patrol this building, okay? So it, it can be able to go to the elevator, and after we build, that's, that's the good thing about the Fab Lab, after we build it, it can go to the elevator, select, okay, push the button, get into the elevator, select one floor, so we're going to take all of NCCU campus and we're going to build a map of it, okay? And therefore that drone will be able to patrol. And since it's got a camera, if a police department want to feed it, we'll be able to feed them, uh, you know, feed them into, um, you know, for their business. So it can help patrol the campus. If we can get permission from the FCC to be able to fly it, you know, around locally. So this, this is where the jobs are.